Good afternoon and welcome to this um, month's Practice as Research um, seminar. Um, my name is Nicole Brown and I'm the person who is heading up the Practice as Research Network. Um, it's great to, to have you all here and like I said earlier, it's great to see some familiar names and faces and connections that we've made over the last few weeks and months um, and I really appreciate your um, being here today. Um, if anybody is interested in finding out more about the Practice as Research Network, please do let me know. Um, I'll share some details at the end of this talk as well. But I am so, so, so excited to have with us today a really, really important and eminent speaker, um, Professor Jenny Pickerel. I'm, I'm so excited. Um, it's one of those things where I'm basically just cold calling people. Um, Jenny and I haven't really met, um, but I just emailed her and I said, I have got this seminar series and I think you, what you do is great and fantastic. And I would like you to present on that. Is that OK? And Jenny kindly agreed. Um, she's made time for us. So I'm, I'm super thrilled about that. Um, Jenny Pickerel is a professor of environmental geography and head of department of geography at Sheffield University. And her research focuses on inspiring grassroots solutions to environmental problems and in hopeful and positive ways in which we can change social practices. She has published three books and over 30 articles on themes around eco-housing, eco-communities, social justice and environmentalism. And she's currently completing another book, um, which is called Eco-Communities Living Together Differently. And like I said, I'm super excited to have her here. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I know much about environmental geography, but um, what I'm particularly interested in and what I'm hoping we're going to be able to explore a little bit further after the talk is that element around participatory activist research, because I do think that that's something that many of us are doing um, and we don't perhaps have the right language to talk about it. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jenny, participatory activist research, reflexivity, transparency and accountability. Jenny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm always happy to talk um, about methods or, or how we approach our research. So um, as Nicole mentioned, I'm a geographer um, and I'm fascinated. Oh, now, now my screen won't forward. Just a second. Yes. Uh, I'm fascinated by social environmental change and how this can be achieved at the grassroots. So I'm starting with, um, there's just three um, slide which don't seem to be in the right order. Right, sorry. Uh, three slides from a short comic that I made um, last year, uh, which tries to describe what participatory activist research is. And it was designed just to have those conversations. And as you can see, the artist has, has tried to draw me, which was a bit embarrassing, but um, hopefully it kind of a, is a good starting point for this talk. So I'm very interested in grassroots um, change and by activists and by eco communities um, at, without the state or formal politics. So I immediately want to get right in there and, and talk to the people doing this change and understanding what they think they're doing. Um, and it's a whole mixture of getting involved, observing, participating and, and sometimes advocating on behalf of as well. So I'm going to come back to that later. So I'm going to start by outlining what I mean by participatory activist research. It's obviously a play on, on participatory action research, um, but I've always worked with activists um, and that, that's why it's quite an important term for me. Then I'm just going to reflect on why I use it, because I think that that always shapes how we do research, what we're in the research for, what we're trying to do. And then the main bit of the talk are kind of reflections on what it means to become intimately involved in activist projects as a researcher, uh, and particularly a researcher, as most of us, working in a particular type of university sector um, that privileges outputs and income and, and various different metrics. So what does it mean to actually invest our time elsewhere, in effect? So participatory activist research requires, in a very basic term, the researcher to participate in the thing they're trying to understand. So hence me with pictures here, sitting around in meetings, eating with communities, but also therefore doing the washing up, doing the cooking, doing the gardening, doing the cleaning. 
And to me, I use this to explore communities, groups, organisations, and I also therefore am contributing to their goals. And I'll come back to that tension later about what that means in practice. Um, so it's premised on the researcher spending a great deal of time in a place, observing and experiencing what happens in the daily lives in that setting. I'm very interested in the everyday, the apparently mundane, and actually what that means is far more nuanced and interesting than the participants realize. The type, duration and level of participation is normally determined by those I work with and the needs of the group and their wishes. So I have been working with one community for over a decade now. Other places I only visit for three days and it's a one-off. So I'm not very much a geographer, not an anthropologist. I don't spend years in places, but I do do repeated visits to numerous places over time. And again, similarly, in some places, it's more about observing, like I am with my camera and my notebook and I sit in on things. And other places, I may play a much more active role in the thing that they're doing. Um, and I might, might end up almost advocating for them as well. Um, so it builds on participatory action research and other ways to describe it might be scholar activism. I've also written an article called Doings in Place which argues that we should we can best understand these dynamics by doing with others in the place that they're doing it. And it's all based on the belief that for me, the best research comes from um, co-producing between scholars and activists, um, that knowledge needs to be useful and to be put into practice, but also that the people I'm working with have more than enough knowledge. So I'm not educating anyone and I'm not theorizing for them, but I might try and theorize with them. And I'll come back to an example of what that, what that means. So here, basically, I often use my role as an outsider to trigger and answer some seemingly very basic questions, but I get them to reflect on it. So this, I was talking about um, why people self build their eco houses and, and what's different about that and the different challenges that they get involved. And a lot of them are like, well, it's obvious this is normal, but actually it's far from conventional. So trying to get them to reflect on actually why and how they do things. So I just want to start with a brief reflection on how I got here, because I think often our own academic journeys shape our own research. So this is the sort of activist scholarship within, beyond and um, against a neoliberal university, which is to say that I never intended to be an academic. Um, my dream as a kid was I wanted to be a Greenpeace activist and I was going to save the whales on the Rainbow Warrior. Um, I had no idea how to do that because I don't come from an activist family, but that, that was my dream. So I started my PhD simply because I love geography and it mirrored a lot of my politics. So in geography, there's a, an undercurrent that we're interested in social justice, environmental protection, collective action, uh, understanding diversity. Um, and, and so to me, that fitted with my politics. But as I progressed, I realized that I could put these things into action. And during my PhD, I became politicized. You can see my pictures here of me looking very young, um, where I became a member of the environmental direct action groups and campaigns that I was working with. Now, for me, this wasn't for the research in itself. It was a realization of my childhood ambitions, but also this idea that I couldn't um, just stand on the sidelines and observe. I wasn't I wasn't going to understand what was going on if I did that, but also I felt like I could achieve more by being part of the movements I was working with. So it's actually through activist scholarship that I developed my politics, it was the activists who educated me as much as I educated myself in my PhD. Um, I found anarchism, veganism, non-hierarchical decision-making, anti-racism, civil disobedience, and the necessity of equity, gender equality, etc. What I learned in my years of my PhD was that I'm not a very good activist. Uh, I'm, despite these pictures of me, actually I'm not normally on the front lines. It's not my favorite space. Um, I quite enjoyed the odd adrenaline rush of street action, but I was better at making banners, writing leaflets, taking photographs, reading and thinking. I felt more comfortable on the sidelines. And for a long time that put me in a big dilemma 
that I wasn't a good enough activist, that I wasn't going to change the world. Um, but I realised that academia might be a way for me to enact my politics, use my strengths, um, give me space and time to work with inspiring people and to share alternatives and different ways of living. And I was never sure that that was going to work. Um, but in hindsight, I think it has. So I spent many early years as a lecturer conflicted about what I was trying to do. Um, like, like most of us, I had a large teaching load, an unfathomable amount of administrative bureaucracy. And I felt I was beginning to lose myself to the neoliberal university. I did less and less activism and I began to feel guilty about not being a good enough activist. Um, in part, aggravated by some of the activists I was working with that liked to tell me that I wasn't very good. So it's quite a harsh space to be in, to be in environmental and anti-capitalist activism in Britain. But what I did was I reset my expectations of myself and reminded myself of the bigger political project I wanted to be part of. And I realized that actually I could contribute to the politics to use academia to enhance environmental activism and social justice. But to do that, I might have to fail at parts of being an academic. So the key thing for me in understanding about scholarship activism is that you can't do both brilliantly. There's absolutely no way that you can excel at both. So at times to survive and navigate in academia, I would have to not feel like the best activist. And at times when I was doing participatory activist research, I wouldn't be able to be the perfect academic either. But participatory activist research allowed me at moments to do the best I could in that space. And so I've used this approach since, I, since the days of being an overwhelmed lecturer to work in community environmentalism, anarchist activism, and the building of anti-capitalist alternatives. One of my key kind of things I want to say today is, it's a space I've always struggled with and always will. And I've come to accept that's part of making it work. Um, that I'm both critiquing academia from some of the activist critiques. So why don't we have horizontal decision-making? What does that look like if we were to treat each other with more uh, respect and we had more equity in the academy? But at the same time, I can step back from some activism and reflect on some of the things that are, are or are not working there. So the struggle has been in never feeling I was doing enough, but I've also never regretted this path and I've really enjoyed the journey of navigating scholarship and activism. And if I can kind of say 20 years on, I've realized and I'll come to some examples, um, how powerful that's been actually to have that journey and the different groups I've had the good fortune to work with over those 20 years uh, has enabled a really quite um, unique experience that I hadn't, I hadn't planned on basically. So one of my things is it's worth staying with the mess because you never know what it might lead to. The second thing I just want to talk about is um, why participatory activist research? What is it that, that I'm doing it for and what is it that others do it for? For me, that initial dialogue between researcher and participants provides a really important opportunity that might not ordinarily take place. So that what am I trying to get from it? What do they want to get from it? Um, often I've had activists say to me that I allowed them to step outside the day-to-day -day grind um, and for them to reflect on where they were at. Sometimes I can give them fresh insights or they give themselves the fresh insights. Um, and I can help them reflect on their ways of working that are often quite unique or share between different examples I'm working with. So it's obviously influenced by feminist and post-colonial frameworks. So I'm trying to read the world for difference. I'm trying to notice the mundane and the everyday and within that, the possibilities. Um, again, I think that can help in activism, um, which can, especially with climate change right now, be quite um, depressing. Um, and I think as academics, we can come in and say, actually, look what you're doing. There's some really hopeful bits here or look what others are learning from you. And also, of course, um, ethically, I like to be actively involved in the research so that I'm not just extracting knowledge from communities. I've also done a lot of work in Australia and um, particularly with Indigenous activists. So the ethics to me is crucial here. 
Um, and in that sense, that, that ethical commitment to not extracting knowledge kind of prevents me from doing some other methodologies that I might have otherwise done. So this approach has enabled me to kind of make the most of my love of activism and its goals but also realizing that it's okay to be a researcher. It's okay to be not a frontline activist. It's okay actually to enjoy teaching and to enjoy writing. Um, and maybe this combination actually makes the best use of my skills. So like I say, in hindsight, I've learned that this was the perfect job for me, but I didn't know that at the time. So um, next, I just want to explore some reflections and I'm gonna draw on a couple of stories about um, things that I have been trying to practice for 20 plus years, things I'm still struggling, the messiness and also accepting it will always be messy. And so I've got six themes um, on some of these tensions that really ask questions around transparency, accountability, the need for pragmatism, which when I was 21, I hated that word. Why would you compromise? And now I'm very pragmatic. Um, and now how you have to kind of navigate those differences, convergences and synergies between academia and activism. So first off, I feel like I've spent 20 years navigating boundaries. And I feel like I, over time, have been getting better at being transparent on what I can and I can't contribute, what I'm willing and not willing to do. And that's been a real lesson learned. But actually working out what my boundaries are has been important for being honest with those I'm working with. Because if I don't say what my boundaries are, then a lot of things have been assumed of me, of what I've assumed I'm willing to do, assumed of my time scales and what I'm going to contribute. So, for example, in these pictures, I did a, a three year project with anti-capitalist activists. Um, who were trying to build autonomous geographies, so building anti-capitalist spaces. And I decided that I wasn't willing to get arrested. This actually clashed with other colleagues on the research project who were willing to get arrested and did indeed get arrested as part of these campaigns. Um, and that put me at odds with some of the groups that I was working with. It was a very personal decision to me not only do I, I've mentioned I also work in Australia, so I didn't want to get banned from Australia, to be honest. Um, but also I wanted to be able to turn up for my lectures in the morning uh, and not have been arrested the day before. So I, I was taught across obligations, really. Um, so that was a tension and that, which I've stood by and defended. And I now know that's been absolutely right for me. Um, and it didn't mean I couldn't participate. Um, this was my buddy at an anti-capitalist protest in the, in the early 2000s. Um, but I also said to him, you know, I'll try and stop you getting arrested and then I'm running. So it was about being transparent about what I was there for. Likewise, a lot of participatory activist research involves intense participation, living on site in eco-communities, working alongside, um, an expectation that you're going to spend the day cooking, gardening, chatting, then interviewing, then writing up your notes in the evening and doing the whole lot the next day. And I've realized that it's okay to run out of energy, to, to not be superhuman. Um, I can't actually do 16 hour days uh, and, and do it all. So I now take a day and a night off when I need, I leave the site to refresh, to reflect, to remind myself of what I'm trying to achieve. So I think with the navigating boundaries is you don't need to be a hero. You don't need to wor always worry about others' expectations of you because they will be much higher than you can ever meet. And instead to work out what you are able to do and what you want to do. And so finally, I've never, I try never to overpromise. I think you have to be careful what, you th what help you think your research will offer. I often start by saying, I'm simply gonna help you document and reflect and record. Often broader change might come as that, but then it's an added bonus. Sometimes the promise is money. For example, I've worked with communities and, and realized quite quickly I could bring a student field class and they could fight, pay for a tour or whatever. But I think what I would say is my boundary is not to undersell my skills, but not to promise that I can somehow access amazing power. Um, and you do have um, some interesting assumptions from others. The second element um, 
is accepting the competing temporalities. And this has taken me quite a while to navigate. The activists I've worked with in environmentalism and anti-capitalism and climate change live in a fast world of urgent action, short-term campaigns, immediate deadlines, making the most of a political opportunity. Academia in comparison takes years to write and publish one article. And so it's not just what use are you going to be if you're working that slowly, but the fact that you are also trying to multiply balance all these other obligations in your job. So I've had a huge pressure from participants to, who wanted me to act as quickly as them, and I couldn't. Um, they wanted me to drop things at the last minute for them. And of course, I've got obligations as a full time lecturer, but also because my role was just different. I need time to think, to reflect, to read, to come back with anything useful. Um, and I, I take me a long time to accept that I'm more than just another activist body, that I need to pull on my skills and be clear about what those are. So I've become a lot better at being honest about these different temporalities. I've offered compromises. So sometimes I'll offer to write a quick report. Um, I verbally feedback, I can do background media work for them, I can share photographs, but also be clear that I might come back to them years later. I might, hopefully I've kept in touch with them over the time, but they won't see anything in print for many years. Ironically, after years of feeling like I wasn't doing enough, for all these eco communities. Um, about five years ago, it began to become clear that actually I was one of the few people who had been documenting their progress in the UK. Um, and therefore I had inadvertently recorded their history in written and photographic form. And I was uniquely placed to share these lessons between eco communities um, nationally and internationally. And now I get quite a few of them say, you know, those photos you took in 2006, well, we've lost them. Could you send them to us again? And that might seem like a really small role, but it actually helps. I've realised that I probably need to build an archive because that's what I've done anyway. So I've ultimately offered them something that none of them had time to do. And that's proving really useful in planning terms for other eco communities and in sharing across those communities. I've really struggled to critique those I work with. I think this is one of the things about becoming intimately involved. They become your friends. You work with them for a decade or more. You've contributed to their project. You end up believing in what they're doing. But academia and my training in geography likes to point out what is wrong, what is not working and what yet needs to happen. So you end up with this tension. So this picture here, it's a classic picture of an eco-community conference. And as you will see, it's white. And the people there aren't oblivious to the whiteness, but it's also quite a difficult issue to raise. So rather than pretend that I'm coming in as some objective outsider and I'm gonna critique what they're doing, I've sought instead to work with participants in identifying their own critiques and then worked in supporting them finding solutions. So I'm doing a long-term project exploring the lack of racial diversity in eco-communities. And here academia offers a rare space for activists to admit what they have no solution for, that actually they don't have the answers and they don't want to prioritize it. And they don't want to be critiqued for that because they're trying to save the world. But actually what they need is some help and some other lessons and some other suggestions. And that's something I'm really enjoying working with from an uncomfortable standpoint, because I'm also white and middle class, but actually that puts us in a position to critique ourselves quite well. So it's about understanding, yes, we've got deep subjectivities, but how do we use them? And how do we use that in a, to create a space that those participants might not otherwise have, where they can truly admit some really quite outrageous things, and then we can work with them on that. Number four, um, it's really easy for participants to want researchers to become spokespeople. Uh, we are hopefully articulate, hopefully we can write, uh, we have media networks, but this creates a really difficult tension that complicates our roles. This was particularly clear for me. This is um, a photo from a project where we were working with Muslim anti-war activists. 
Um, and obviously I've got permission to take this picture. Uh, but the idea was for some of these Muslim activists that um, I would be a really good bridging person between them and others. Um, now, we might be struggling multiple identities in our research already. So I think it's really difficult if we then end up speaking on behalf of our participants. It's something that I've really struggled to negotiate. I don't want to be the center of the story. I want the participants to be the center of the story. And as researchers, we're accountable to them. So advocating is full of risks. What I've ended up doing is only advocating based on research findings. And that takes a lot longer once developed. So never in the early stages of a project when actually there's a lot yet still to be understood. So I never want to be the story, the face of the campaign or the projects I work with. But I have spoken to the media and to planners one or two years into a project. And then I'm very clear to signpost them to other people, but to say my research findings show this. So I've tried to remember that Actually, in this space, I'm not an activist, I'm not a spokesperson, and I'm not a journalist. So what is it that I'm bringing as an academic to this space? And what do they, my participants, need me to bring? They need me to bring the research um, kudos in, in effect. But to do that, I need to make sure I'm speaking from my findings. I've mentioned ethics quite a lot. I think it, it's vital to be honest in this work. Um, on the one hand, my own politics has facilitated access to these places that I've sought to work with. There's a kudos to pass activist work. I've built an eco house myself. I know the right phrases and languages to use. I think we all do. We learn um, how to kind of get ourselves into a space. But I think we have to use this honestly and transparently. So, for example, I mentioned, you know, my activism, I found veganism. Veganism is big in eco communities and activism in Britain, but actually I'm no longer vegan. So um, it's deeply unethical for me to pretend to be vegan. It seems small, but this is central to many people's identities. So I have to be really honest when challenged as well, and but honest in, in who I am. Equally, I sometimes politically disagree with those I'm seeking to work with, and I find it's necessary to be honest about my politics. It's not the same as convincing anyone. It's not the same as pointing out they're wrong, but it is about me showing myself to be my full political and ethical self in order to get trust, but also good research, but just to be ethical. Um, so, of course, I'm not going to agree with everyone that I'm working with. But by doing that, it creates a really useful space of dialogue, of mutual reflection, of creating space for further questions. Um, it's a reminder for me as well to bring my full political and ethical self to all of academia. Um, it's very easy in academia to buy into the individual competitive survival game, uh, and that's fine. We need to do that at certain moments. But when, like me, you become a head of department, that's exactly when you should be putting this stuff into practice and remembering what you would do if you were also in a different space like an eco community. So reminding myself to be political and ethical at all times, I think is useful, not just in research, but in, in academia. And finally, um, being emotional, I've done a lot of work on emotions in activism. And as a feminist, I've always sought to bring emotions into my work, my everyday and my teaching. I think that we need to recognize the emotions of becoming intimately involved in activist projects is really important, not just to do good research, but how emotions um, is, is important to understanding change more broadly and how it changes us as researchers. So being open about my emotions with participants has often allowed them to open up about their worries, concerns, or feelings of joy that I would have missed. I don't bring my emotions to give them to them to sort out. I think that's a boundary for me as well. They don't need to know my stresses. But I also think that um, we can't pretend to be unaffected by some of the things that we experience and see. Um, and certainly I have been deeply, deeply affected by some 
of the situations that I've been involved in. I think it's important that we talk about that and, and bring it to the work. Um, so being emotional is obviously a central part of being human. And I don't think we should hide it when we're doing our work. So to conclude, um, I think participatory activist research is messy with unclear boundaries, competing temporalities, emotionally and physically demanding, and there can be really unclear outcomes for participants. But what I hope you might take away from this talk is that despite all of the navigations required, ultimately it's this messiness that produces rich, meaningful research and useful outcomes for participants. Despite having to navigate boundaries, temporalities, emotions, subjectivities, uh, this approach can, however small it might at first seem, help and support social and environmental change initiatives. While I've found this approach really challenging, I've never regretted employing it as a framework. I've enjoyed the challenges, however emotionally fraught some of them are, the questions it's raised for me, and of course, the work it's enabled me to produce. Um, but it's also never static, um, and I've, I've tried not to be locked in by it, so I, I less often describe myself as an activist anymore. I used to use the term scholar activist a lot. Um, my career has um, taken me to a point of being a professor. I spend more time in the academy now. I'm really not a frontline activist. So while my political priorities remain, and I hope come through in my work, um, it, I'm putting that into practice in very different places, um, perhaps more in the university than I would have previously done. That's not to apologize for it, but again, that's part of that honest, transparent approach that says, this is what I'm doing now. And I think it helps us remember that, that we don't stay the same and we're never going to do everything brilliantly at once. I have had some moments where I'm very involved in participatory projects. And then I have some months where I'm dealing with university bureaucracy. And that's just what my job entails. Um, but more than anything, I, I continue to believe that only working actively with others beyond the academy, trying to put knowledge into practice and challenge the idea that knowledge is only produced in the academy, that research can become more politically and practically useful towards social and environmental change. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to give you a real round of applause from myself, but I do know that um, a lot of people will have found that really, really interesting. There are some virtual um, rounds of applause as well. Um, and um, obviously, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I have got uh, quite a few questions, but I, I'm not going to hog the conversation. Um, although I may, I may um, rip, rip the, the wheel around to my turn again at some point. Um, but I do know that there are some people who have got some questions for you as well. Um, there is one question that was raised in the chat box. So I'm going to just read that out for you. It says, how do we approach justifying emotions in a perceived close to emotions environment? Um, you know, when you were talking about the emotions and bringing emotions in, um, especially, you know, that environment of, of the academy that doesn't really allow for that. How do you, how do you, what, what kind of language have you got? What kind of, you know, justifications can you offer? I, I think that's a great question. And I think one of the, the, the ways in is to use the language that the university itself uses back to itself. So um, obviously each institution is different, but Sheffield University has gone an absolute frenzy of well-being since COVID. It likes to try and send us on lots of um, yoga lunches as if we've got lunch times, and so I think I've kind of used that as a as a way of saying it's it's not well being that we need to talk about. Um, it's it's about creating space where we get to talk about emotions, the emotional cost of things like COVID, the emotional consequences of um, what happens in REF and TEF and NSS. So I try to pick a way in which, you know, I realize the university is trying to avoid it by giving us yoga classes, but actually what, it, what we need to be doing is, is saying that we need to be thinking about the emotional consequences of our working environment. So when I became head of department, um, I said to the whole department in my kind of pitch that I'd bring emotions in, that I would cry, that it's okay to cry in my office, it's okay to have a bad day, 
it's okay to feel like you're running out of hope and those are the times actually as a head of department I need to know. So I'm not saying that that enables everyone to suddenly bring emotions in, but I do think we can lead by example. Um, and we don't have to have this image of being a perfect, professional, autonomous person that's not going to, to show the costs of working in this environment at any time. So, I mean, I always call it feminist and there's quite a long history of feminist geography, so that helps. I'm sure it's probably very different in different disciplines. Um, but it, it's, it's helped in the department actually. Um, and it, it has helped us realize that um, our job making us cry is not a good outcome. But if we are crying, then we actually need to talk about it and get help. Thank you very much. So there's a follow up on that. It says here, thank you, Jenny. Um, that really helps. Um, I had photo voice data, which brought us all to tears in the past. However, when it came to writing the paper, I was told not to mention this. It felt quite a difficult moral decision for me because I am an um, early careers researcher and I wanted to publish. And I think that's kind of speaking to, to, to the follow up question that I had as well is that, you know, it's, it's, it's about navigating that space. And you mentioned that you say that as a head of department, you're now in the position as somebody who's already a professor, you're now in the position of being political and, and emotional and, and ethical in, in that self that you have created for you. But how easy or how difficult is it for somebody who's potentially on a precarious contract, who's potentially on a zero hours contract, who's potentially having to find their way into academia and is, is an early careers researcher? How would, what kind of advice would you give to those people? Exactly. I think there's something really important here about not beating ourselves up for following the rules of the game. So I feel like I'm now in a position where I can articulate more clearly what I was trying to do and why. There's been plenty of stages in my career where I haven't, where I haven't really um, shared what I'm doing in my research. I, I didn't call it a particular type of research um, because I was more cautious about how I was being judged. Uh, I certainly, um, as a woman, faced all sorts of barriers. One of the things I, I try and say with those early career that I work with is it's okay to play the rules of the game until you're in a position where you're more able to push those boundaries. I think that we can be, those of us who are established can make it sound too easy yes. and suggest to others that they should fight the fight all the time as if that won't have real consequences for your career. So my, my kind of um, suggestion and, and often to, to others is, you know the boundaries you can push, that might be really uncomfortable. You might be able to come back to that data in future and write a really powerful piece on the role of emotions in that research. If now's not the time, that's not your fault. Yeah. You can't change everything at once. And so we have to go through academia with different moments of priorities and not be naive about the, the inequity that we face. So I don't know if that really helps, but- It does, it does. I think it's going back to the kind of advice that I also give, you know, is kind of pick the battles. Um, you know, you're in for a long war, so pick the battles, choose the battles right. Um, and some battles you might want to fight back on straight away now because it's it's inherent to who you are as a researcher, as a scholar. But 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 some battles are better left alone, like you say, it, and and come back to in five ten years. You know, there there, there may be then the space to do that. But but yes, um, I, I I agree with what you're saying. Um, there's a question also about um, um, participatory activist research. So could you please explain um, or talk a little bit more about the relationship between um, participatory activist research and anthropology? So obviously I'm speaking as a geographer um, and my most engagement with anthropology has been in Australia where I was working with indigenous communities that have a, a very long and difficult history with anthropology. So. I, I don't want to pretend that I understand exactly how everyone practices anthropology right now. But 
I view participatory activist research in a more interventionist way, which is that we aren't necessarily just observing, we're going into change, and that that doesn't necessarily take that long to do in certain spaces. So it could take three days, it could take a few weeks, it might take a few years, but there'll be moments of um, intervention as opposed to any kind of long-term um, engagement. So to me, geography and participatory active research is far more piecemeal than some anthropology is. It's, it, we tend not to be focused on one space uh, we might have a broad theme, for me, environmental geography, but it involves working with lots of different groups in lots of different countries over time. So for me, um, I say that it's not anthropology because my experience has been when I've spoken like this to anthropologists, some of them are horrified by the short time frames. Um, by the way, I'm bringing my own politics. What am I doing? Bringing my own politics into a space that I'm meant to be working with. So I suppose... Um, I, I kind of want to defend that, that shorter time frames, we are political, I share my political views, um, and that's, that's to me part of doing the activist research in this way, acknowledging that lots of other researchers and disciplines might be horrified by that. And that's fine, because we need diversity in academia. Thank you very much. I think um, it's, it's one of those things that people understand particular kinds of ways of, of working and, and ways of doing research in different kind of, you know, like philosophical outlooks and from different lenses and then it could put their own spin on things a little bit and that that then, you know, diverges and, and brings people together in different ways and there are overlaps, but it's not exactly the same. So I, I totally get where you're coming from. Um, there's um, a question here. Michelle Fine talks about the seven commitments of critical participatory action research. And one is about holding ourselves deeply accountable um, to the communities most impacted by social injustice. Could you say a little bit more about the accountability as workers in academic institutions? Wow, yes. So is that about... Um our accountability to academic institutions or the tension by being accountable to others while we're in the university? It's probably a little bit of both actually. Um, if, you, if, you could, if you wouldn't mind address both a little bit, I think it's probably relating to both. I was wondering the same, but I, I think it's probably both. Yeah, I think one of the things um, to me that that, that PAR approach allows us to do is understand ourselves as being in a difficult working environment as well. Not to, for a moment to suggest that being academics is relationally harder than any of the other spaces we work in, but that we can look around ourselves and see what injustices are happening um, to those that we work with. Um, and uh, to me, it allows me, for example, to think, well, actually, regardless of what my experience with early career was, what's it like now? Because it will be entirely different. So the accountability is um, to not what you think you know, but to the lived experience of those people now that you're working with um, and making sure that you're hearing uh, everyone's um, current experiences and then trying to understand what collectively you can do about that. Um, so, that's my approach, which is um, to not be locked in my own history, but to think about how we're currently working um, and thinking about those who are on the lowest salaries, often professional service staff and cleaners, um, and making sure that we are supporting them and treating them with the same respect that we treat everyone else. I think there is a really interesting tension about being accountable to those beyond the academy while also working in an academic institution. I think that most of us end up with um, huge tensions, both in um, time and energy. And also I would say that a lot of those people who don't work in university think we've got very easy jobs. Um, they can look quite well paid and quite secure to those who don't know otherwise. Um, and I, it's also, it's not for me to bring my problems <laughs> to those communities. So it's not an argument about me pointing out that actually a lot of universities, a lot of staff don't have permanent contracts, but instead to um, 
somehow try and, and navigate that boundary again of what you can contribute and what you can't without over justifying it. So I do think it's really important as academics, we don't take our problems to those we're working with. Um, but the accountability is also sometimes being honest about what you can and can't do. Um, and yeah, that's a bit of a waffly answer there, but yeah. I don't think, no, I don't think so. I think it, it, it just goes to show how difficult it is to actually navigate that space in that Venn diagram in the middle. <laughs> you know, it's kind of easy when you're on, on the left because yeah, you're on the left or it's easy when you're on that right of that, of that circle in that Venn diagram. But as soon as you hitch up into the middle of it, then you obviously have to, 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 to drift around and, and find how, how that middle really works out. And in many ways, my next question is going to 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 make this um you know to to actually look at that specific space um you say you called yourself um, a scholar activist um and and i was particularly interested in how you're doing reflexivity in that activist researcher space do you you know do you do you ever feel that you're in the field and you're thinking oh i'm a bit too much of an activist here i need to hold back um, or, or do you feel, well, actually, I'm not, I'm not researcher enough and if to need to push that further. So how do you physically do reflexivity when you're out there in that middle of the Venn diagram? <laughs> yeah, very good question. Um, yes, to both of those. I think I have felt that I'm not doing enough, but then I've realised, well, hang on, I'm meant to be taking photographs and taking field notes and setting up that interview, but I've just got involved in this really fascinating planning meeting for another action. And I've kind of forgotten about the other stuff I was doing. And I think that's one of the things about constantly being pulled between, but actually that is also the really productive space where you're trying to be involved and view and then ask different questions. Um, and I, I do find that I write a lot of notes. I always ask people if I can write things down, but often those notes are questions for my future self. You know, when I've got energy, this is what I need to go back and look at. But at the moment, I'm going to focus on doing this, this one thing. Um, and, and I think the intensity of, of doing that is important, especially when I'm working with early career colleagues that might think that somehow we didn't struggle with that. And we didn't need a break in between something intense or we don't need to to um, debrief um, after some of these events as well, um, because we do and we do even more so because we've been on heightened alert for so long, um, perhaps more so than some of the activists have. I think um, yeah, I never really felt like a very good activist in part because um, I think my head was always slightly in the analysis mode. Uh, I've always wanted to know why we're doing something um, and is that the best strategy and is that the thing we should be focusing on and, and some of the people I've worked with are like what let's just do it um, but I think that in any room you're full of people like that so it's not yes yeah, scholar being a scholar activist however you want to label it is a unique position but then in any room or community, you've got those who are interested in theorizing more anyway. You've got those, and I've, I've worked with them. He said, I'm not interested. I'm just, I'm quite happy to do the cooking. Genuinely, so that's what I want to do, and that's okay. So, so when, did you get any pushback from either academics or activists about that, inhabiting that space? Um, uh, saying that you're not, you know, I mean, because you say yourself that you you weren't activist enough, but but did other people think the same, or did they say actually you're too activist here? Oh, I've absolutely had the same. So I've had I'm not activist enough, especially in British anti-capitalist and, and anarchist spaces. You know, if you don't live the life enough, and you don't dedicate yourself enough, then you're not enough. Um, and we certainly had to, I say we, because there were a couple of us had to pull out of a case study area um, because they said, you're not activist enough, you're not pulling your weight. Um, and actually, we don't want to work with you anymore. And that was quite hurtful. We'd spent a long time working with them. And again, that emotionally quite hard. And then we had to go, well, actually, that's the boundary. They've set it. So we have to respect it. Um, but I still remember that. So it obviously hurt at the time. Um, and others, um, there was a project in Australia that I participated in for two years. I became too activist. I forgot to remind them I was a researcher. Um, I got very involved. It was my local group. We did, did a lot of things. And at the end, 
uh, I presented my findings and all their jaws dropped. And they said, your findings? What do you mean you're here as a researcher? And, you know, two years is a long time. And so they had gone. So I think that it's a, it's a space where you're never going to quite get it right because neither do you want to remind them every day, I'm a researcher and an activist. Um, and sometimes you're going to disappoint. And if we're talking about emotions, I hate disappointing people. Um, and yet I feel like I have done that. <laughs> um, and that's been hard. But again, it's also me going, oh, hang on, it's messy. I could never meet everyone's expectations here. I never could. Even if I was just an activist, I probably couldn't meet everyone's expectations. Thank you. Um, so there are a, two questions in the chat box that I'd like to raise with you. Um, on these ways of being activist, feminist, scholar, um, and you can only totally segregate them in writing, which often mystifies the overlaps. And, and actually, there, so there is this, this kind of, this is the one question, you know, on these actually ways of being and, and, you know, the separation happens later on. And then there is a similar question. Do you mind sharing how did you separate your multi identities with yourself as a person? So those two questions are quite related to one another, but it is about that, that navigating those, those different identities. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. It's one that it comes back to one of the earlier questions about writing. Um, so in some of my writing, it looks like it's beautifully separate. There's a paragraph about methodology and then here are all my findings. But I have also written quite a bit about the messiness and the complexity of what it means to be trying to do things at once. So I guess I, I, I um, try and try and demystify the overlaps in some writings. And then also because, we, you know, I need to keep my job and I need to get whatever highly rated articles out. I also kind of fudge over them to get to the findings as well. So in that sense, um, I, I have, I adopt, I allow some identities to become more primary at certain moments than others. I think is what I'm trying to say. So again, it's not about hiding who I am, but it's about acknowledging in some spaces I need to be more of one thing than the other in my writing. Um, how do I separate? I'm not sure I've ever separated in the sense that I do try and live my life with the same politics that I do my research. So um, I have try very hard not to be a hypocrite. I try very hard to live a, an eco ethical lifestyle, to practice what I preach, um, to teach in that way and to kind of allow the messiness to happen um, and, and being okay with that. And also I think I end up teaching quite a lot about there's no perfect environmentalist. Um, so to students don't lose hope, um, everything you do helps basically. Um, there's a comment in here about um, David Graeber who, who kind of didn't separate them. And I, I think absolutely there are those who manage to um, beautifully bring everything to every piece of work. Um, I, I don't, obviously he's great and his writing was great and all of those things, but I also don't, there has been a real hero worship uh, in some parts of academia where People have used the activist scholarship identity, not David, um, but have used it as a way of showing how great they are, as opposed to the movements that they're working with or the cause. Um, that, that happens in geography. Geography is great at producing often male heroes. Um, and I, again, purposely want to do good work, but not become the story. Thank you very much. I think this is a very, very good point to, to stop here. It's a really, really fine. You know, it, your final sentence was just brilliant, you know, in terms of bringing that back to say, actually, what you're focusing on is, is the good work, um, but not you becoming the center of that story. I think that's that's really, really lovely said. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much, um, Jenny, for having been here today. It's been absolute pleasure. It's been really exciting. Um, and I'm going to share um, very quickly an outlook 
um, on what we have lined up for you the next time, which is architecture of slowness. So it's about reflecting on the actions of historical repetitions and loops. And um, the person who's going to present on that is Matthew Butcher, an, an, an architect and um, academic. So it's, it's going to be really, really interesting talk about that. Um, if you are interested in any of the other seminar recordings, please do check out the, the YouTube channel, the Buzzsprout channel, um, and the Practice as Research website, and you've also got my email address there. Um, again, Jenny, thank you so much for having been here, for, for having done this um, for us today. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I do hope that we'll, we'll be able to connect um, some more, because actually, in the end, the questions I've written down on my notes haven't been answered. <laughs> so there is many, many more questions to be asked. <laughs> so again, thank you very much, and I do hope some of you will join us again next time. Thank you very much, everyone, and, and great questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you.